So we are talking about identity, identity today as we wrap up the sermon series called um, Raise the Praise, and what we want to do is, is go into the gospel uh, text, into the good news that John shared with the first disciples, and we're still sharing today, and it's a conversation that Jesus had with a, a woman, and I know you've heard this before, but people don't care about how much you know until they know how much you care, All right? And so this woman knew that Jesus cared for her, and she had a very real question, and Jesus answers this very real question. I pray that you know how much he cares for you. He cares for you, and because when we know that, when we can embrace that, we're going to actually care about what he has to say. And here's what he has to say. It says, Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. So she has questions about worship, about praise. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know. For salvation is from the Jews, or on the next verse, next verse. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers, the true worshipers, right, will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. And the woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming. He who is called the Christ, when he comes, he would tell us all things to which Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Am he. Uh, Josh Britton is the director of worship here at Trinity. He's next to me. I think that you might realize if you've been here at Trinity, if you've been here in the worship in the gym, we usually don't wear suits. Um, Josh kind of challenged me, asked me if we wanted to suit up, so I said, let's suit up. In fact, I said, let's suit up, let's put on some Captain America socks. And so I think you all might see that. Josh didn't officially suit up because his socks are just plain. This is a stretch for me. All right, well, we appreciate the suit. We appreciate you suiting up. Um, And so um, we're wrapping up a sermon series called Raise the Praise. Uh, We've been talking about worship. It's based off of Psalm 95 where the psalmist says, come. Right, there's an invitation. Let us, right, not by yourself, but let us right, sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. So in this sermon series over the last four weeks, we've talked about how in praising God and worshiping God, right, there's overflowing hope. There's overflowing hope. It encompasses, it, it gives, it's an expression of this hope. There's illuminating love, illuminating love and worship. There's inexpressible joy in worship. We talked about that last week. We had Carla Hudgens, who's been here at Trinity for over 33 years, come and talk about joy. And today we're talking about peace, abundant peace. And and Josh, just a little background on Josh. He's been here at Trinity, I think I just mentioned this a few minutes ago, a whopping seven and a half months. Maybe it's almost eight months now. Uh, Josh has been a director of worship actually for 11 years, 11 years. He's actually been leading worship for over 18 years, right? So Josh has been doing ministry. Uh, many of us know this. Josh has two kids in our day school, little Charlotte and Moses. Uh, he's married to, to Liz, who, who's a great worshiper, and she plays, what's, what's the instrument again? Banjo. A banjo, and so maybe we'll see Liz leading us in the banjo if Liz is here right now. It's a little challenge to get out of your comfort zone. <laughs> With the banjo. We love you, Liz, and thank you for loving this guy and dressing him well, especially for this moment. Uh, but when I think about peace, when I think about peace, um, there's a definition or just something that I understand where peace comes from. When I see people who are able to be real, who are able to be authentic, who are able to express their insecurities or their struggles or their joys, people are able to be real and authentic. That tells me that person has peace. Right? They know who they are, and they're comfortable in their own skins. It doesn't mean that person's perfect, right? but it means that there is peace. And if you see that in somebody, most of us want that. And I've noticed that in Josh for the last nine months that I've been getting to know him. Uh, he has his peace. He's able to express um, his doubts, his worries, his insecurities. He's just able to be real. I've never for a moment thought that Josh was putting up a facade or putting up a, a wall or trying to be something that he's not. It doesn't mean that Josh is perfect, but it means that he has this, this peace, this peace. And I do believe that peace comes from an identity, an identity. And we saw that video, uh, but as we go in this message now, Josh, I have this one question for you as we begin is, what is peace? How would you define peace? 
Yeah, so peace for me has always been about knowing the person and the work of Jesus Christ. I think peace is just knowing who I am and whose I am in Jesus. Um, you know, we know that because of Scripture, peace is a gift. It's, a, it's one of the fruits of the Spirit, and I think it's just a natural byproduct of being in relationship, of being in stride with who God is and knowing that. And because of that, I think we have peace when we know who and whose we are in Christ. And, and there's amazing freedom because of that. There's an amazing peace that I pray is continually washing over all of us as we go throughout our journey with Jesus. And Josh, as we were talking about this peace and kind of the outward and, and inward identity thing, you talked about a duck. So why don't you share it with all of us as worshipers? What's, this, what's up with the duck and peace? So has anybody ever seen a duck or a goose or a swan or any kind of bird kind of floating along the water ever, like early in the morning? Anybody? You can raise your hand. It's cool. That's fine. Yeah, so like hopefully when the water is like still in its glassy state before any boat has come and disturbed it, there's no wakes, there's no waves, but it's just kind of like this calm, cool, tranquil moment. You see often ducks floating along, and they're just so peaceful. It's just kind of like it's just happening. They're just moving. But we know underneath the water, their little feet are kicking pretty hard to make that happen. They make it look really easy. And so often, oddly enough, I relate to that because I think we want to have it all put together on the outside, right? Our externals, we're worried about how we come off, how we present ourselves. But really, our inner spirits are maybe at turmoil we don't have peace because we maybe don't know who and whose we are, or we forget, or we listen to competing voices. Um, and so often, I think we get off track because God's peace, uh, shalom is the word for it in the Old Testament. It's an all-enveloping, all-encompassing, from the inside out kind of thing. Um, and I think God, that's what he wants for us, right, when we're in relationship with Jesus um, so we don't have to look like a duck, right? We don't have to be worried about what we look like on the outside when it's oh happening from the inside first and flowing out of us. There could truly be an amazing transforming peace, right, that Paul talks about all the time in the New Testament. We don't get it. It surpasses our understanding, but it's just there. Um, it's resting on us. It's coming from the, out, the inside out, and it's an amazing thing. Yeah, as Josh is, is talking about his story with me and preparing for this message, uh, 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. All right, this is John, the little cousin of Jesus, one of his disciples, the one whom Jesus loved, and certainly Jesus loved everybody. But in 1 John chapter 3, uh, John says this. He says, How great is the love that the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. All right, how great is the love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And then he says this, and that is what you are. And there's an exclamation point in the English translations, but there's also that emphasis in original Greek if we can get that, if we can get that identity, right, there is peace. There is peace when we can just live in the truth. I am God's son. I am God's daughter. Um, so as we talk about peace, I don't know if you're going to be able to see it in your bulletins, but we have some, some notes for you just to receive this and take this home uh, with you throughout the course of this week. Um, but we're going to be talking about abundant peace and where does this peace come from. And so again, let's go back to John chapter 4, verse 24. This is the New Living uh, Translation. Uh, for God is spirit, so those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. And so the first point uh, today about abundant peace in worship is this, is abundant peace is found in the spirit. Abundant peace is found in the spirit. And so Josh, why don't you unpack that for us? What was Jesus saying? Yeah, so I really saw this on display for the first time when I was a junior hire. I went to this uh, event called Acquire the Fire in the Silver Dome, and there were over 20,000 youth at this event, and it was amazing. And th during a time of worship, I happened to glance over to my right, and there was a girl who was kind of embodying this. Uh, she was crying. She was completely brought to tears because in that moment, um, she wasn't worried about her externals, right, our physical shell, which maybe constrains us and, and causes us to maybe hold back at times. But her spirit was leading the way because she was so moved by the realization of who Jesus is, um, who she is, what God has done for her through the person and the work of Jesus Christ, that she was just brought to tears in worship. And I had never really seen that before. And it kind of shook me that somebody, my own peer, Right? As a junior hire, I was definitely insecure and definitely worried about what other people thought, but she could care less. And that kind of rocked me, and it was like, wow, what does she have that I don't? And it made me hunger more for the truth of who God is and how um, the more I know 
him, I'm not focused so much on myself, but I'm, I'm looking at him and he's allowing for all these things that maybe I used to care about to fall to the wayside, and I truly have peace because of that. Um, and it was just an amazing witness, seeing her just in her element doing her thing, and I was like, wow, I want that. Like, I want to be moved by who God is all the time in my life. So peace is found in the Spirit. And so notice how Josh just talked about that. Let's do a little exegetical thing, a little Bible study here. What was Jesus saying? Right. I think a lot of times we read that text, oh, true worshipers worship in the Holy Spirit. Right. And in truth. But what Jesus is actually saying there is true worshipers worship in their soul. Right? In their being. True worshipers worship in the emotional connection that they have with their Father. They're able to express it. They're able to be real. Right? They don't put on a facade with God. Right? True worshipers worship in the Spirit. Right? Does that mean the Holy Spirit? Right? It means, again, your soul. But God, was, what does Jesus say next? And this is the next point. Because right, true worshipers worship in the spirit and their soul and their emotional connection. And notice, again, before we go to the next point, right, you have the director of worship, you have the lead pastor here at Trinity. And we're not saying this. Right? Jesus is the one who said this. Right? Worship the Father in spirit. Connect to him emotionally. Right? Let him know who he is. Right? Let him know what you're going through. Right? Connect to him. But as you connect to him with your soul, right, you also do this in the truth. Right? And the scriptures tell us that the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. And so, Josh, why don't you talk to us about the second point of, of peace, abundant peace, because it's found in the truth according to Jesus. And so, how did this take hold of your heart, of your life? Yeah, well, it was sixth grade. I remember it vividly. And uh, we were studying the truth. We were uh, during religion class. We were in God's Word. And it wasn't anything big or earth-shattering, but it was almost like a light switch just went off in my heart, really. Um, just something happened in me in a moment. It was... Just like, man, I, I knew that if I could give the rest of my life to knowing God's truth, his word more, knowing who Jesus was more, if I could share that in any way, in, in form, in capacity, based on how God had gifted me or wired me with whatever skills and talents I had, I wanted to surrender my life over to him, essentially, and just say, God, I'm, I'm willing to be sold out so that other people can hopefully know you more, that I can point people to who they are in you, Jesus, that they can have a new identity, that they can find true peace because, Jesus, that's who you are. You, you step into any situation. He's a prince of peace. That's one of the, the names that we know of Christ based on God's word, that he's a prince of peace. He can step into any situation, any life, any relationship, and bring transformation, and that is amazing. And I just knew in sixth grade, oddly enough, just randomly sitting there one day, wow, okay, yeah, I think this is what I'm supposed to do. This is what I'm supposed to give the rest of my life to. Um, and, and, and God's just been faithful to open up doors every step of the way, and it's been an amazing ride so far. So his promises and faithfulness took hold right, of your heart, then you said, I, I want to share this. And as a director of worship, right, you get to share that. Because right, right, our desire is that we get to connect with God through our worship services, right, that our souls are alive, that we're able to be real, but that that's in the context of his promises, his faithfulness, his truth. I, I love that song that Bree uh, led us in during our offering time, Praise Your Name, right, that, that real battle that that songwriter wrote about that Bree just sang us through that we're going to maybe get an opportunity to sing in the future, right? I will take hold of the truth of your promises, right? I want to worship you in truth, Right? My spirit and your truth is going to connect in this worship time as we move forward. And, and so abundant peace is found in spirit, right? in the spirit, and also in the truth. And then this next thing, you say this a lot, you kind of say it this way, um, and you say it this way sometimes, to be honest with you. Uh, peace is found in first commandment living. This abundant peace is found in first commandment living, so why don't you unpack that for us? Yeah, and so, does everybody remember what the first commandment is? You shall have... Oh, come on, let's try that again. You shall have no other gods before... Exactly. Putting God first in everything we do. And uh, we read this at all the other services, so we're actually going to jump into Second Chronicles chapter 20 right now. Um, and if you have your phone on you um, or your Bible with you, I encourage you to just open it up or later on go back to this chapter because we're not going to read all the verses. It's an amazing chapter, but we're going to kind of skim through this really fast. Um, so Jeho Jehoshaphat is the king, um, and they're surrounded by all these warring nations. 
And um, he pretty much has a choice. Um, he's afraid. He can turn to other things that would be easy to turn to, like putting his trust in the logical thing, like maybe swords or soldiers or their army. Um, but as we go through these verses, Jehoshaphat calls people to fast. He calls people to worship. He calls people to be in prayer. And as he leads, um, it's amazing what happens because people start catching on to that. The husbands, the wives, the fathers, the mothers, the kids, they all start following his example. And as he goes to God as the first response, um, so do they. And I think if we're really honest, um, a lot of times we don't always put God first um, in tumultuous situations. In, in situations where we often turn to other things or seek to fill those voids with other means instead of maybe going to God. But he actually does it the right way, and I love that example. And uh, because of it, um, a, a battle is won because, get this, he sends the worshipers out on the front line, not the soldiers, but the worshipers. He puts literally musicians and priests out f- first, which is insane. Like, who does that? But he does. He did it. And guess what? God, God routes the, the surrounding nations. He actually causes them to turn in on themselves and to destroy themselves. And I think that's just an amazing example, an amazing picture of when you put God first, and you allow him to come in into situations that maybe it doesn't make sense that we would first turn to him to, uh, he can route them. He can work amazing and mighty things when we allow him to show up in his big way that only he can in situations. Why don't you go ahead and read that text for right. us to see if you can pronounce these words, these Ooh, Old Testament yes. words for so us. So some men came and told Jehoshaphat, that's a fun name, don't hear it every day. A great multitude is coming against you from Edom, from beyond the sea, and behold, they are in the Hazazan Tamar, that is, in Gedi. Then Jehoshaphat was afraid and set his face to seek the Lord, I love that, and proclaimed to fast throughout all Judah. And Judah assembled to seek help from the Lord. From all the cities of Judah they came to seek the Lord. And he said, listen, all Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem and King Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord to you, don't be afraid and do not be dismayed at this great horde, for the battle is not yours but God's. You will not need to fight in this battle. Stand firm, hold your position, and see the salvation of the Lord on your behalf, O Judah and Jerusalem. Do not be afraid and do not be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them and the Lord will be with you. Then Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground, and all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell down before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. And when he had taken counsel with the people, he appointed those who were to sing to the Lord and praise him in holy attire as they went before the army and say, Give thanks to the Lord, for his steadfast love endures forever. And when they began to sing and praise, the Lord sent an ambush against the men of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, who had come against Judah, so that they were routed. And I just love how worship leads the way in that. It's amazing. Yeah. Um, And so the next, this is how I fight my battles. There's a popular contemporary song that was written a couple years ago, and it's actually based off of this uh, chapter in 2 Chronicles. I think a lot of times in a a world that doesn't seem to have peace, in our own worlds, in our own minds, in our own hearts, in our own soul, we forget how to fight. And in Second Chronicles, I love that picture, right? Because we fight through singing. We fight through praising, right? This is how we fight, gathering together and actually having an opportunity to sing together. I picture this verse, and I picture if we, in the spiritual battle of life, right? Hey, Josh Britton. Hey, Carla Hudgens. Hey, Bree. Right? Go ahead and, and lead the way, right? Take the front lines. Lead us so that we can join you in singing. I think this is just contrary to how we think. Right. But if you've been uh, in a relationship with Jesus for a while, and if part of that relationship with Jesus is singing, is praising him, I hope you can relate to this truth and embrace this truth even more because this is how we fight our battles. Right? We just worship him. We tell him who he is. We live out this identity as his child and just praise him. Right? In the midst of the storm that we can praise him and that he'll give us that peace. He'll remind us right, who we are and whose we are as we fight our battles. And so, Josh, you are the director of worship here at Trinity. Uh, overall worship, not just contemporary worship here in the gym. And so you have a moment to speak to us. You have a moment to speak uh, the people who have been part of the Christian faith for all their life, part of Trinity all their life. 
uh, people who are new to the faith too, who are perhaps new to, to worship life here at Trinity. So what would you say to us about raising the praise in worship? Well, I think we can take some logical steps, just like if we were to try to maybe get our health in order, we'd probably go to the gym, we'd probably eat better, maybe try to get some more sleep, whatever. Um, in the same way, when it comes to getting stronger in our faith and our relationship with Jesus Christ, the more you can be in the Word of God and immerse yourself in it, the better. So whatever you have to do, whether it's listening to maybe Christian radio stations or creating a playlist for worship music or putting more songs on your phone to have a playlist for when you work out or when you run or whatever you do, to have the truth of God, especially in the format of song, obviously that's always going to be when I probably go to first, is amazing because you can just let those things wash over you even as you're going about your day or at your workplace or at home. You can never have too much Jesus in your life. And so likewise, if there's podcasts, if there's other sermons, if there's a small group, if you aren't already connected, whatever it takes to be in God's word and to have community. I think community is super important too, especially if we're new to the faith. I think one of the things Satan loves to do is to isolate and to get us alone and separated. Uh, but we weren't created uh, to be alone. We were created to be relational and in community with each other. Um, that's how literally God designed us as, as a relational uh, being himself, um, that is what he wants for us. And we have peace because of that. And we can have security in our identity when we're surrounded with like-minded people who are feeding on the word of God as much as you can. And if maybe you're a little further along now in your walk and you've been doing this longer, you maybe have a little bit more mileage in your faith walk with Jesus. Um, the thing that comes to mind is my grandma Britton, actually. She's 94 years old. And about 20 years ago, my grandpa, who was a pastor, passed away. And instead of letting um, that rock her world, rightly she mourned, right? Um, but her identity wasn't completely tied up in her marriage or that relationship. Still, even through loss, she remained focused on the fact that she was a daughter of Christ and she belonged to Jesus. And so that kind of fueled her to kind of kick it up a notch into another gear. Because after my grandpa passed away for almost the last 20 years now, she's gone on more mission trips in her, you know, well, long years as a 70, and throughout all of her 70s, 80s, and even now into her 90s, she's done more mission trips, led more Bible studies, and, and used her gifts more uh, to glorify and point people to Jesus than she ever has. And that just is completely astounding to me because she gets it. She grasps that if she's still here, if she's still breathing, if God hasn't called her home yet, we get to be part of his kingdom work. We get to be part of being that city on a hill, the light of the world. God's not done with us yet, so we still have something to do. And, and, and that witness just speaks volumes to me that, you know, I don't ever have an excuse to slow down. And having faithful um, saints like that in your life to encourage you, to equip you, is such an important thing. So I'm super thankful for the blessing of her just going strong. Even now, she's 94, like I said a second ago. She's in her uh, a, a kind of a, a community home now where she's going to be until she passes to go be with Jesus, but she's still leading Bible studies even there at that home. I spoke with her a few weeks ago. She's still playing the piano like twice a week. It's awesome. I love her. It's amazing. Romans 12? Yeah, and so um, this is an epistle that we uh, read at all the other services, but I'm going to read it for us quick. It's Romans 12, uh, 1 through 2. It says this, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship, or as some other translations say, your, your spiritual worship. So don't conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, and then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. And so she gets that. She knows that everything she does can be used for worship, not just coming here on a Sunday morning or Saturday night or Monday night, but everything she does in life can be an act of worship. So whether it's in your relationships, in your workplace, in your home, Everything we do can be used to point people to Jesus ultimately to give God the glory. So what I hear you saying is worship is more than a song, right? You're not just a director of worship. We're all directors of worship in our own life, in our own homes, in our own families. It's more than a song, right? It's the life that we live, the sacrifices we make to honor God. Um, and so, Josh, I would ask you this, and I'd ask you all this, right? Any time of, of life we need to be able to answer this question, why Jesus? Why Jesus? How does Jesus fit into this message about abundant peace and identity in worship? It's all about him. Everything we do, um, I love Jesus because he loved me first. And um, 
I have a pretty good dad, right? Um, but he's not perfect. Um, but thankfully, he pointed me to the perfect father. Um, and that's what Jesus did his whole time in this world was while he was building his kingdom through his earthly ministry here, he was pointing people to the Father. He was revealing the heart of the Father that no matter who you are, you are not too far gone because you are perfectly loved. As imperfect as we are, we are perfectly loved by a perfect Father. And that's amazing. Um, That gives me hope. That gives me peace. That reminds me again of who I am. I don't try to, I don't have to try to be somebody I'm not or something I'm not. Uh, But God's grace finds me just as I am and accepts me and loves me and forgives me. And that's an amazing thing. I need to know that and be reminded of that every single day. So Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I think sometimes we, we forget about that. Let's say it again, right? Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He came to reveal the heart of the Father so that we know who God is. And not just know who God is, but know who we are. And so his disciples, specifically John, said, right, how great is the love that the Father has lavished on us, right? that we should be called children of God, right? sons and daughters of the Most High of God Almighty. Right? And then he puts emphasis on that because it's as if his audience didn't hear that or it's as if we don't receive that. Right? That is what you are. That is what you are, right? children of God. So many of us, including me and Josh, right, we have all these competing voices in our head. The world tells us who they think we are. And so often we give in to that, right? And, and our identity all of a sudden becomes something else that's not true. That's not real. That's not eternally real. Right? We are children of God first and foremost. Right? We know who we are, right? And we know whose we are. Right? Our perfect heavenly Father. And when we can embrace that, receive that good news, there is peace. There is peace. And when we worship in spirit, in truth, and keep worship way more than just a song, right? It's first commandment living, right? There is peace. There's peace. Uh, thank you, Josh Britton, for joining our ministry here seven and a half months ago. Uh, we, we pray for you that God's going to continue to use you to lead us in, in worship, right? I don't know if you know this or not, but Josh gives me peace. He gives me peace as our director of worship, just relying on him and knowing that God has gifted it and, and called him. Aw, thanks. What, yeah, no problem. I'll get you some socks for Christmas, some cooler yes, socks. Yes, please. Um, but I'm actually going to put Josh in the spot here just for him to pray us out of this moment, into this moment, uh, for God just to give us peace. And if you could uh, lead us in the Lord's Prayer then, too, as you wrap us up in prayer. Will you guys pray with me? Dear Jesus, thank you so much that you came to bring life, that we would have it to the full. And part of that is a full measure of peace. And God, um, forgive us. Forgive us when we get off track. Forgive us when we don't put you first. Forgive us when uh, we try to fill our lives, uh, maybe voids or situations or relationships with other things that aren't maybe your best, what you have for us. But God, help us to truly put you first. Thank you, Jesus, that you give your peace abundantly. Um, Thank you that you aren't stingy with the fruit of your spirit as you pour it out amongst your church, among your people. So Lord, we pray that today, no matter what we're going through, where we're at, Lord, that we would experience your shalom, that whole peace, that all-encompassing, all-enveloping peace like never before. The God, that you would truly wrap your arms around us and just remind us that we are your sons, we are your daughter. And if we are your sons and daughters and you are the king, God, we're royalty. So, Lord, may that infuse our living. May that inspire us to truly be the church that's redeemed, that's been won back Uh, Lord, that's the greatest thing ever. And so, Lord, help us to live in that, in that reality, that we would have peace and that we would know who and whose we are. So, Jesus, thank you that we can bring all these things before you. Thank you that you set the example for that. You tell us to come boldly um, before you to place all these things at your feet. And so, Lord, we do that this morning. All the things in our hearts and minds, Lord, we lay before you, knowing that we are forgiven that we're free because of your sacrifice, because of what you won for us through the cross, through Calvary. God, we love you. We thank you for that. And so, Lord, all these things that are on our hearts and minds, Lord, we bring to you today, and we lay them down, and we pray the prayer that you taught us, and the words are on the screen if you don't know it. Our Father, who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thy is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Um, and we're going to close the service with a song called I Am. Uh, you can go ahead and please rise as I hide my socks from you all. But this song is an identity song. Right? I Am is how God has revealed himself to us, the God who was, who is, and will always be. But it's also a statement that we know I am a child of God. And so may we praise God through this song as we declare who he is, what we have in him, and who we are.